and then she went a walk with him up the, the River Clyde and she went missing and he never told anybody and then he eventually admitted that he had beaten her and thrown her in the Clyde but they, he wouldn't admit it to the police but he did tell everybody else and of course her body was found in the River Clyde the day the Falklands War started in 1982 and he bragged about killing her to everybody but we couldn't charge him just because the police told me at the time that she was just a wee drunk alcoholic woman, you know, what did it matter? She didn't really count, I suppose, but she counts to me. And I know that she had a really difficult life. And um, yeah, so poor Annie, but she lives on and, and her laughter and her madness. She's always there somewhere. Um, no, my mother um, had a boyfriend called Peter and he had just come out of prison for trying to kill another woman. And of course, my mommy fell tragically in love with Peter and he got charged three times um, trying to attack her previously and then she went a walk with him up the, the River Clyde and she went missing and he never told anybody and then he eventually admitted that he had beaten her and thrown her in the Clyde but they, he wouldn't admit it to the police but he did tell everybody else and of course her body was found in the River Clyde the day the Falklands War started in 1982 and he bragged about killing her to everybody, but we couldn't charge him just because the police told me at the time that she was just a wee drunk alcoholic woman, you know, what did it matter? She didn't really count, I suppose, but she counts to me and I know that she had a really difficult life. And um, yeah, so poor Annie, but she lives on and, and her laughter and her madness, she's always there somewhere. We live in, rather strange times at the moment there's a a lot of victimhood about and and in a way that's why your attitude is so refreshing in terms of you know your ability to to fight back and determination to to fight back against injustice do you think though that without the outlet of your comedy you'd still have been able to do that because although it might not be the most obvious channel that you would direct someone to who'd gone through the multitude of traumas that you have it is a channel to express yourself and to and to reclaim your own territory in a way isn't it your own experiences Absolutely, Mariella. Absolutely. That's a really good way of putting it. It was a good way for me to channel all the, you know, all the stuff that I'd went through. It was a good way to stand on stage and go, my uncle abused me, but I don't want everybody to rush the stage and hug me. It's okay, because I grew up and the family I married and he wanted to kill him for my birthday. But you know what men are like? They're really rubbish at picking presents. And to hear everybody go, <laughs> <laughs> like, there you go. You like so you're laughing at a joke about child abuse and murder and that makes me happy because these are subjects that we can speak about and yet it did help me channel it and it did help me reclaim it and it did help me own it and then when I wrote my autobiography that helped as well um but telling the stories that because you've got to remember child abuse is the one thing you're not supposed to speak about you're, that's the one they told me not to talk about that's the one thing he told me never to mention that's the one thing that people will maybe you shouldn't speak about that I spoke really loudly about that I won awards for making jokes about it so it kind of smashes the the silence and it kind of makes me very proud that I took something that was so hurtful and so dark and turned it into a big loud laugh with all of the subject matter that you've got, as we've discussed, to, to delve into, uh, what made you cast your eye on Nicola Sturgeon uh, during the pandemic and decide that she was a woman that you thought you'd like to um, emulate or at least satirise to an extent? Because the, 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 the daily briefings were so long and so boring. We just needed the facts. We needed somebody to come out and say, you can only have six people for six hours they six families and two Alsatians apart and you can't go out and you can't go to the park. We just needed the facts, but we had to suffer. And it wasn't her fault. You know, you had the journalists asking questions like, oh, are you allowed to stroke a cat? Wake up. And you're like, oh, the love of God, shut up. They were just so long and boring and contrived. And I thought, why don't I take the actual facts and make them funny and make her just say what we can do and what we can't do? And, and make it funny. And I did that. And loads, I mean, thousands and thousands of people have told me that, you know, they say things like, oh, you got me through lockdown, or you made me laugh. And when the daily briefings went on, we wouldn't we wouldn't watch Nicola. We'd wait until she was finished and we'd watch her. And I made sure I stuck to the absolute 
health facts so that I didn't, you know, didn't give false information. Jenny, just finally, I wondered how your cancer diagnosis, now your second cancer diagnosis, has impacted on this determination that you clearly show to, to make the best of life um, and not to be cowed by your experiences. It must have come as a blow. Has it made you reassess how you think about things or actually just given you the determination to crack on? It was weird. I always kind of knew something was going it's weird that I always knew something was going to happen to me. I always knew that it was coming around the corner. I can't explain why. I've been healthy all my life. I'm the healthiest out of my mum's and dad's four children. I'm the strongest out of them all. And I always knew there was something over the hill waiting for me. So it wasn't really a surprise that it was cancer. I kind of felt there was something wrong. It's made me think that I've done so much in my life, so I don't have any regrets, other than the usual when you make mistakes, when you say things wrong. I've got all those regrets. But I have done so much. I've written plays, I've performed off Broadway, I've written books, I've, I've done national theatre, I've done great acting, I've won awards, I've done so much. And now I just want to get with a bang. I want to go out doing what I love doing, which is stand up. This will be the last big tour I'll ever be able to do physically um, because of the chemo and because of the cancer. And I want to just enjoy it and I can't wait to get back on stage. And I, I think it's made me feel a bit like a mayfly. I might not have long, but what I've got, I'm going to fly high with. Uh, why have you decided to set off around the country despite your diagnosis, which I think for a lot of people would have been um, a very good reason to stay at home and put their feet up and pray? Um, well, I've spent a year and a bit in the house. Um, I've had the cancer now for over, well, it was diagnosed November not that year, the year before. So I've had a lot of time to lie about. Um, I got awfully bored with it. I've always been a worker. I've worked since I was 16. And I find it really difficult not doing anything. That's been the hardest part of the cancer is being um, idle. <laughs> Idle's mm. the wrong word, but, you know, not being on stage. So, so um this will be my last big tour. I won't be able to do this again as the cancer progresses. So I want to, I want, I want to do it. I want to get back on stage. I want to feel normal again. I just want to feel okay, and being on stage makes me feel okay. And in terms of what the audience can expect, is this going to be um, a, a, an act that that's absolutely? packed brim full of your current experiences or are you going to be delving back I mean you've managed to turn uh, so many topics into comedy that other people's other people probably wouldn't touch with a barge pole your, your, your mother's murder child abuse which you experienced uh, along with your sister uh, in in your youth um, gangsters married to one lived amongst them um, I mean the, has comedy been your your weapon do you think uh, in terms of developing resilience to the things that you've lived through i just think that for years um it was always the comedy was always a, the dominating area for men and men were i mean I, I was speaking about child abuse and murder 20 years ago on stage and it was women didn't do that women did whimsical interesting comedy um and men got to be the confessional comics and i i wanted to just be me on stage because I'm not good at being anything else but me whether it gets me into trouble or whether it gets me applauded I'm good at just being me um so yeah I think that you should be able to tackle all these subjects on stage I don't think there are subjects that can be to be as long as you're punching up and not punching down um I, I think that my life has there is so, the thing is the Scottish people tell you really sad stories and then laugh at them and, and that's yeah. inherent People will say things like, that's my other kidney broke as well. <laughs> and they're like, why are you laughing? <laughs> I've realised that Scottish people laugh at the thing that went wrong, the thing that's went wrong. So I'm happy to get up on stage. And what people can expect for this show is a lot of love. There's going to be so much love in the room because people haven't seen me on stage for over a year. Um, there's going to be some old classics. I have got some belters of old stories. I mean, you can't have toured for 25 years and not have some old classics. There's some new stuff. It's not all going to be about cancer because that would be boring. And there's going to be a sing-along. Oh, we love a sing-along. Well, let's start with the old stories um, because I'm sure many of them will have emerged out of your own 
uh, childhood and youthful experiences mm-hmm. in the East End of Glasgow. T- tell me a little bit uh, about your childhood. You were the youngest of, of four children. I think your father was an alcoholic. Just tell mm-hmm. me a bit about about what you remember uh, about your childhood. There was a lot of love. I know that people find that hard to believe and I tell them that I was also sexually abused as a child by my mother's brother, who we eventually get put in prison and then he died. Sure, that's a shame. But um, uh, there was also a lot of love and a lot of laughter. My dad um, stopped drinking um, in 1982. So when he died, he'd been sober for over 30 years. My mommy, Annie, was a product of the 60s. She was the woman who... Um, a product of, you know, the sorry, the post-war years. She, she, her mother died young, so she was raised, bringing up her brothers and sisters, and I suspect she didn't have a very easy time from her own father. Um, my mommy was the woman in the 60s who got put on Valium and Quaaludes and Mandrax. What they did then, when a woman was upset, they're like, oh, put on a really thick underskirt and go take nerve tablets, because that'll cure you. They never listened to them and they just put them on tablets. And my mom had a lot of mental problems and she ended up in a, a Gartlock mental asylum a few times as well. And despite all that, I still had quite, I had so much love and laughter in my family. We were a funny family. My brother's still funny. My other brother, Jim, he died in 2010. He had taken to heroin and then ended up with HIV Um complications but Jim was funny my brother Jim once brushed an Alsatian backwards and told me it was a lion and I believed for a whole <laughs> month it a lion in the house turns out he was just a lion man but I I have so many funny stories of my mommy and all her pals singing in the house Glasgow women love an angry song he broke my heart and then they all drink really angry and smoke violently and shout to each other and I'm thinking that might not do that when I'm older um there was so much love and laughter and the fact that we could do things that children can't do nowadays I mean your listeners will be stunned to find out that when I was seven or eight I used to go up complete strangers door in their tenement knock on the door and say can I take your baby out and people gave me a baby (laughs) what what just to take out as a sort of accessorize with their baby to take to the park I'd go to the park with a baby. I don't even know if I fed it or changed its bottom. I'd just pull it out of the pram, put it on the grass, and then sit on a swing and sing basic <laughs> other songs. I mean, are they still alive? I don't know. <laughs> um, you, you were also, though, from a very early age, and I think maybe quite surprisingly, as you were the youngest, you were also a, a, a real fighter. I know you took a red-hot poker to the uncle who abused you. Um where do you think that fighting spirit came from? Uh, were you, as the youngest, you know, did you feel you had to fend for yourself or, or or were your siblings looking out for you? My siblings looked out for me as well. I had a real sense of injustice when I was younger. I remember I uh, did a drawing for the school um, and the, the school won a, an encyclopedia because my drawing was the best drawing that at that week in the newspaper and they wouldn't let me pick up the prize because my uniform was so tatty and dirty and they let a boy who had a perfect uniform present the prize to the school and I remember standing looking at the stage going this is this is wrong I shouldn't be punished because I'm poor and that stuck with me all my life that being punished for poverty and when I was at secondary school they gave my mum five pounds to buy me a gym kit which was a huge mistake giving Annie five pounds of course, she bought a couple of Carlsbergs and two bottles of Iron Brew, a Bridie and some Siggies. And then the next week I went to school and they went, where is the, the sports shoes that you need for gym? And I said, I don't have them. They went, we gave your mum a fiver. I said, well, that was your first mistake, was giving my mum money. And they wanted to give me the belt. Back then it was corporal punishment. And I refused. I said, I'm not taking, I'm not being beaten because I'm poor. If you want to beat someone, I suggest you go find my mummy and beat her for the fiver. And good luck with that, because she's a bit of a firecracker. And I remember and, just that, that injustice. Well, you say firecracker. I mentioned uh, the poker to your uncle, but then in later life, uh, in adulthood, you ended up taking him to court um, yeah. because of the sexual abuse that you experienced. I mean, taking back control like that, A, must have been incredibly powerful, but, you know, it, it takes enormous courage and strength to do something like that and and you know we all know the situation that too many women find themselves in when they're trying to describe scenarios like that and boys of course I, I, 
had I known how hard it was going to be, I probably wouldn't have done it. But I did it. Uh, my sister and I went to the police office and we just, everybody's like, oh, we'll sort them out, we'll do it. And I'm like, no, I, I don't want them to fix it. I want them stood in court and I want them to face me in a court of law knowing what he did to me. And of course he pled not guilty. He said I was a liar, I was an attention seeker, said the same about my sister. But since then, so many other of his victims have came out. Um, and he he was, um, he used to teach the flute in the Orange Lodge. Um, so there's quite a lot of access to younger uh, girls there as well. But getting them into court was the best thing I ever did, the most terrifying thing as well. Um, but they found him guilty and he, he, I think he only served like two years or something, but it wasn't the sentence that was important, it was the fact that we took him to task. Just knowing, knowing that that wee lassie who stood there defiantly in that room years later, stood facing him in a courtroom knowing that he's going to go into prison as a paedophile was possibly the best feeling other than giving birth to my daughter in my entire life.